Trying to condense Hinduism into a single video is both impossible and potentially insulting. I, Hinduism, the, the, the term Hinduism, uh, did not even, you know, was, was not even invented until centuries after the practices, the worship, the beliefs uh, originated. It was centuries <laughs> between the beginnings of Hinduism and the invention of the, of the term Hinduism. Hinduism has a variety of beliefs. There's no unified structure. There's no unified system that all and only people believe if they are Hindu. It doesn't work that way. So, uh, you know, to kind of account for this, you need to keep in mind uh, two things, at least two things. The first is I am not an expert in Hinduism. Uh, I have done some readings on Hinduism, and I'm trying to convey what I've found in those readings, uh, but I am myself am not an expert. So I'm probably going to get some things, you know, I'm not going to be able to explain some things as well as, as an expert would, or as somebody who is a Hindu would. Uh, if you are an expert and you are watching this, I am open to polite correction. That's just fine. I'm sure this is not the last version of this video, and I will try to incorporate uh, whatever corrections are offered in later editions. Uh, the second thing to keep in mind is that um, there's kind of you're going to have to allow for a variety of beliefs within the term Hinduism. Even some of the fundamental concepts have contrary claims made to them, depending upon which school of Hinduism you're appealing to. Nevertheless, I'm going to try my best to give this video and, and try to introduce you as the viewer. Uh, into some of the into some of these notions, I'm not going to say fundamental because <laughs> not, there's nothing that all and only Hindus believe, right? Uh, but some of these significant notions, these uh, major notions that uh, underlie what we refer to as Hinduism. Atman is your real self. It is your eternal self. It is your spiritual self. Right, but what does this mean? Okay, so look down deep into your depths, right? Take a moment and try to examine right, your biggest desires, your strongest feelings, your greatest values the most important values they have will make you what you are. None of that is Atman. All of that that I just described, your feelings, your emotions, your desires, your wants, your values, that's only the ego. That's the, you know, the non-real self. That's what under, uh, uh, Atman underlies that. It is beneath that. It's what... Uh, allows you to have that, but that's not your real self, right? Your deepest desires are your ego, what you want. Your values, what you hold dear, again, that's what you want. And that's what you're clinging to. That's the false self. Now, what you're clinging to grounds you in this world. It keeps you here nails you into this belief. But that's not Atman. That's not the point of Atman. Right? Atman is the fundamentally real self. It's the eternal self. Your beliefs change. Right? You, you believe different things when you're a child than when you do now. Your fundamental values change. You do not have the same values now that you used to. And when you grow older, you won't keep those same values. Those will change. Well, if that's what changes... If that's what changes, like this body, this body changes. I mean, this hand is going to get wrinkled. Right? More veins will appear on it. There will be more wrinkles that appear on this face. My hair is going to go gray. Some of it's already started. Right? All of that is what changes. Well, if that's what changes, that's not your fundamental, that's not your real self. That's not your eternal self. Atman is the real self. That's the eternal self. Everything else that you're experiencing, and as far as that's concerned, all of what you're experiencing as far as that's concerned, that's not real. That changes. That comes and goes. 
It's the eternal that's what's real. And that is Atman. The eternal, not the changing. Brahman might be the most difficult thing to understand in Hinduism. Yet, at the end of the day, <laughs> you achieve enlightenment when you do understand Brahman. Okay. So what is Brahman? Well, look at the things around you. Uh, some are hard, like you're, like you're rigid, right? You're like your computer is rigid. It's hard. If you knock against it, you'll, you'll hit resistance, right? Some of it is soft, like your pillow. Don't try it right now because you might fall asleep. Uh, some of it is hot, like coffee or tea or a shower. Some of it's cold, like lemonade or ice. Uh, some of it is sharp, like needles. Uh, some of it is dull, like a spoon. Um, the, all these things that exist around there, all these things, have Brahman as their source. Brahman is the ultimate reality. It's the, it's the essence of everything. Now, Brahman is interesting because it, it has no limits, right? Since everything comes from Brahman, it has everything in it. It has its potential in it, and its actually actuality in it. Brahman is all things. Brahman is all things. It is both hot and cold. It is both sharp and dull. It is both hard and soft. It is the source of it all. It's the source of everything. And it is both transcendent in that it's above all things, right? Metaphysical is being beyond and above all things, but it's also imminent because it's here. All things are Brahman. Okay. Now, since it, yeah, it's, it's, it has all things, it is both their potentiality and their actuality. The gods and goddesses, even, are manifestations of Brahman. They, you know, these gods can be different from each other, but that's okay because Brahman is all things. They, these gods can, can even be opposed to each other, but that's okay. Be, they can still be from Brahman because Brahman is all things. All right. Everything is Brahman. Everything is from and in the ultimate reality. Now, as long as we're kind of on this topic, it's important to know there's at least two main, you know, two differing schools of thought about Brahman. One is that Brahman uh, is a person, right? And that Brahman has intelligence and consciousness, and, and a will. That, that's one view of Brahman. Another view of Brahman is that Brahman is not a person. And this isn't to say that, uh, you know, this is a limitation on Brahman, but rather to say that Brahman is a person is itself a limitation. So Brahman, well, on this kind of line of reasoning, Brahman isn't a person, and to say that it's not merely a person. It's so much more than that. It's so much more than a person. So the, keep in mind this division between these two main ideas about Brahma being a person and about Brahma not being merely a person. It's going to be important later on. But this, this is a really important, it's going to become important later on when we consider the statement, Atman is Brahman. There's a variety of ways that we can translate in English the word dharma. Uh, code of conduct, duty, virtue, morality, or even religion. Maybe most broadly we should just think of dharma as uh, how you should live your life. Maybe. I know, I'm adding one more translation in there, right? Um, 
Dharma is how you're supposed to behave. It is your duty. Right? It's your obligation. Okay. But it's important to remember, um, while Dharma is universal law, Dharma applies to everybody. Everybody has Dharma. Not everybody has the same Dharma. Right? There's different rules depending upon your station in life. And this, you know, isn't necessarily difficult to believe. There's different things you should do, different ways you should behave to a child if you're a parent versus, you know, if you're just merely somebody on the street, right? So if there's a child in front of you, you have a, you know, there's a child crying. You should do different things depending on whether you're the parent of the child or just a stranger. If you're a stranger to the child, leave the kid alone. That's not your kid, right? <laughs> the parent is there to take care of the child. It would be uh, perhaps a little uh, obtrusive for you to come in and console the child, right? A parent should, you know, pick up the child and console it or, you know, whatever, right? Or if a, or if a child is misbehaving, right? Maybe it's, you know, it, it's, I'm sorry, maybe it, it's the duty of the parent uh, to discipline the child or to correct the child's behavior, but not yours, right? If that's not your child, don't discipline the child. That's not yours. So Dharma, I'm not saying that necessarily is Dharma, I'm just trying to explain that one's duties or obligations can change depending upon one's station in life. Uh, but Dharma, you know, so, so with Dharma, these are the duties, these are the obligations that you have, right? Okay. Now, Dharma, um, you know, as I said, dar your Dharma, uh, Dharma is everywhere. Everyone has Dharma, but not everyone has the same Dharma. Your Dharma differs depending on your station in life. Okay. Now, it's important and in, in, to recognize that in Hinduism, you're supposed to perform your dharma dispassionately. And what that means is you're performing without uh, enthusiasm. You perform it without dread or hatred. You perform it without reluctance. You perform it without gusto. Right? Emotion is the ego. Emotion is the physical, the now, the transient, the temporary existence. Okay, You're supposed to perform dharma. You are. You act according to dharma. But you do so because it's dharma, not because you want to. You do so because it's dharma, not because you don't want to. And still have to. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I don't know. Some of you obey the... You, know, you, you can't give a, an example. Some of you obey the speed limit. Some of you. <laughs> now, some of you obey the speed limit because you what you uh, are enthusiastic about moderate speeds, and you think that that's just fine uh, to travel this speed, and it maximizes efficiency and fuel consumption. You know, uh, and you know you really enjoy that speed, right? Some of you obey the speed limit, but don't really want to, right? It's I want to go fast, I want to go fast, but here I am doing the speed limit, I really don't want to. Right? Neither of those instances is following the speed limit dispassionately. Okay? Uh, to follow the speed limit dispassionately, you drive the speed limit. Because it's the speed limit. That's it. That's it. It's a peaceful, content obeying of Dharma. Not an enthusiastic, exciting obeying of Dharma. Not... A grumpy, hate, you know, a, a grumpy and resentful following of Dharma. No, it's following your, it's performing your duty, dispassionately performing your duty. Karma is literally translated in English, to action. action. Now, oh, what karma does, at least in, in the context of Hinduism, it, is it governs the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. So, Hinduism, um, a claim in Hinduism is reincarnation. The Atman, the real self, uh, is born again in different physical bodies. So, uh, now, there are better ways to be reborn and worse ways to be reborn, right? Uh, you can, um, uh, and you know, the best ways aren't necessarily human. There are some, uh, I don't remember details, but there are some stations, uh, there's some kinds of rebirth that are better than human, right? Uh, I think it's some, some animals, but 
I, I don't really remember. I'm not exactly an expert. Um, so, you know, this gar karma will dictate your station in life, your station uh, or what happens uh, for your death, and your station in rebirth. Karma dictates what happens to you during this life, and it's related to dharma. Whether you follow dharma or not determines the consequences. That's karma. Um, if you perform dharma, good consequences will follow. If you, if you fail to perform dharma, bad consequences will follow. And in, to put it simply, in, you know, good things, or what goes around comes around. <laughs> it's how, kind of how in the West we uh, describe it, right? Uh, if you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. Okay. Now, and the good things in this case are, is dharma, and the bad thing is violating dharma. So you now it's important to remember that yeah, what you do now impacts not only your life now, but your future incarnations. Right? Your future incarnations. Samsara is reincarnation. Right? It's this cycle of life, death, rebirth. That's samsara. You're born, you live, you die, you're reborn. Now you might think that, uh, you know, this sounds great, right? Some, you know, get to be born again and again. I, in a sense, I live forever. Right? I live forever. I'll, all I have to do then is to always follow Dharma and my rebirth will always be good. Right? And I'll live forever with good consequences. Right? Now, you, you might think that. We're, we're tempted to think something like that in the West. You want to do good things, so you'll be born again and again. Moksha is this liberation from samsara. Now, you might think, wait, well, hold on a second. What do you mean liberation? It's like, well, moksha is a good thing in Hinduism. It's the freedom, the liberation from being born again and again. Now, you might wonder, wait, wait, why would I want to stop that cycle of rebirth? Wouldn't it be great to you know, live forever with good consequences? It seems like a good thing. Well, <laughs> think about it. If you're born again and again, you're always in this transient, temporary, flawed, limited reality. If you're always in the temporary, flawed, limited reality, you're never... Uh, you're never experiencing Brahman. You're never experiencing the unlimited. Your experiences, your life, your choices will always be limited, not unlimited. Uh, why would you want a merely limited reality? Why not? Why wouldn't you want to pursue an unlimited reality? Unlimited reality. And this is Anyway, this is where moksha comes in. Well, if, if you are liberated from reincarnation, you can experience unlimited reality. If you're liberated, you're, you rejoin Brahman. So there's a phrase meant to refer to uh, this whole process to achieve moksha, to be liberated from samsara. And in the phrase, at least in English, is Atman is Brahman. Atman is Brahman. Now, the point behind this uh, is that uh, the eternal self, the real self, uh, is this unlimited reality. Now, you know, again, there's kind of two different ways, at least two different ways to understand this. You know, if, if the idea is that Brahman is a person, right, that Brahman is a person, has intelligence, has a will, has consciousness, um, it's not to say that, uh, you know, your person disappears when rejoins that person. No. I mean, there's a distinction between 
um, that you know the person of Brahman and and you uh, and, and your Atman. However, as a creation of Brahman, right, your Atman reflects Brahman. It's it, it, um, it, it as much as Brahman is the ultimate reality, uh, your eternal self. So, like, you know, Brahman is the ultimate reality, and these things around it are just manifestations of it. Your eternal self uh, is related that way to your. Uh, a, you know, to your physical attributes, to your desires, you want so just manifestations of the real self. But it's not the real self, right? And you can want many different things. Right? So your your real self is like Brahman, right? Or, or or is Brahman in that kind of relationship between Brahman and the things and Atman and, and the ego? Okay, that's one way of understanding it. Another way of understanding it is the second way of understanding Brahman, in that Brahman is not merely a person. And uh, you are Brahman. There's an identity between you and Brahman. Right? You, you are at once a manifestation and are Brahman. Right? Both those things uh, together. And in you know, either case, right, that's how moksha is achieved, is through this enlightenment, uh, through this realization that you are Brahman. And if following Dharma is the way to do this. You do your duty not because you want to, right? So dispassionately doing your duty, separating a, a, or a, a detachment from oneself, performing one's duty uh, to achieve enlightenment. That's the rough idea, at least the best way that I can uh, explain it. And, you know, so you don't do things because you have desires, you do things because it's your duty. You don't eat because you're hungry or it's your food. You eat to sustain your life. That's your duty. You don't, um, what? You don't uh, um, pursue a career because you enjoy doing it. You do so because it's your duty as part of being a society. Um, there's you know, lots of ways, you know, and you know, because, and again, your career will be determined by your station in life. Uh, and when you start acting not out of the ego, but as as Atman, and by that means you you don't act passionately, you act dispassionately. You come closer. The more you work on that, the more you meditate on it, the more you contemplate that. You come closer to moksha, and you're liberated from reincarnation by being liberated from the self.